Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Anker. I'm here to talk about reducing friction in health information technology. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm having bandwidth problems and so I pre-recorded my presentation today. As we all know, if you are pushing a heavy mass across a surface, uh, your success is going to be strongly influenced by the amount of friction. So the force uh, is going in one direction and the friction is exerting a force in exactly the opposite direction. If we can reduce that friction by putting some oil or smoothing the way in some way, then we're going to get a lot farther and faster than we did uh, with the friction. Friction is very high in a lot of forms of clinical decision support. And as an example of this, we can say uh, low, low information drug alerts. Uh, in, we, we define these as the same alert for the same drug on the same patient in the same year. Uh, we know that these alerts are actually pretty common. Um, about a quarter of all drug alerts are low information alerts and that they are strongly associated with override rates. So this is an example of a system that has a lot of friction in it. There's useful information in the drug alerts, but the low information alerts are creating friction that's making it harder for everyone to do their job. In this project, we were looking at ways of reducing friction in decision making. And what we were inspired by here is a lot of work on the effect of the default option, which shapes the way we make decisions without creating friction. So uh, the default option is the one that obtains if I do nothing, if I make uh, no decision, then the default option will happen. As an example, this is a photograph of the um, ground floor of my office in Manhattan. And you can see that if you walk straight in from the front door, what you see in front of you is the elevator. And so the default option is obviously the elevator. You'll walk right into it. It turns out that there is, in fact, a staircase, but it is very discreetly hidden behind the elevator bank. And so uh, you, you don't see it. You'd have to turn. You'd have to walk, walk farther to see it. And very few people then choose it. By contrast, in the new Belfer Research Building on my campus, uh, if you walk in the front door, you are greeted immediately by this lovely, huge staircase. And uh, there is, again, there's an elevator bank, but it is hidden discreetly behind the staircase. And so fewer people choose that than the staircase. So this is an example of how the default option shapes our choices. In information technology, it's even perhaps more influential. Um, if every time we buy something online, uh, our name gets automatically added to the email list. If we if we fail to uncheck the uh, the the sign up box, so usually nobody overrides the default. No one um, unchecks it, and so we all end up on all of these mailing lists every time we buy something. These effects, as well as as other related effects, are called nudges. And uh, I really recommend this this great um, popular book by Richard Thaler, who recently won the Nobel Prize in Economics for this work, and Cass Sunstein. We, um, we, we follow the default option, not only is it easier, it's obviously easier to, to choose that one, uh, but also because uh, we frequently infer, and, and often correctly, we infer that the default option is the one that is endorsed or recommended by whoever set up uh, the social system or the technical system. So we leverage this to try to address problems in opioid prescribing. If we cast our minds back to last year, we will remember that um, the, pan the epidemic we were really worried about then was uh, opioid overdoses. Still obviously a, a concern today. There are many contributors, of course, to the opioid epidemic, um, but one of them was uh, overly generous prescribing of, uh, of opioids. Uh, there have been a number of initiatives to try to change the way doctors uh, make decisions about doctors and patients together make decisions about opioids. Uh, the one that we added to the mix was a nudge, and it leveraged the default option. Prior to our change, the e-prescribing order entry was the same as it was for any other sort of prescription. The order uh, is called up by the physician. The physician types in the drug name or chooses it from a, a pick list and then uh, has to select or type in the SIG and all of the details. With our innovation, as soon as the physician or the prescriber enters the drug name and the system recognizes it as a short-acting opioid uh, used in acute pain, 
uh, the order auto populates with the minimum dose that's recommended by the CDC for opioid naive patients. So as you can see here, as soon as you type in oxycodone, uh, it auto completes with the CDC recommended minimum of three days supply. Uh, there's no hard stop here. If the prescriber disagrees, all they've got to do is put their cursor in that field and type something else. So there's no hard stop. There's no uh, justification required. It is a very gentle inter intervention. We deployed this at two different organizations. Uh, Wild Corn Hill Medicine is my um, uh, medical center, uh, and we did this in the ambulatory setting only, so a multi-specialty ambulatory setting, um, largely uh, insured population in New York City. And our colleagues at the Community Health Center uh, Institute for Family Health uh, simultaneous, or a few months later, did it at um, 20 uh, community health sites in and around New York City, serving a safety net uh, population of um, publicly insured, uninsured, and privately insured patients. At Weill Cornell, uh, we can see uh, small changes in prescribing patterns over time. Uh, the the y-axis is the proportion of prescriptions that have 12 or fewer pills. So that's the CDC recommended uh, minimum um, for uh, uh, for new opioids for opioid naive patients. We can see that before the CDC publication, um, it, uh, very few of the prescriptions were of uh, these 12 or fewer pills. After the CDC guideline was published, we can see slow increase in adoption of those guideline recommendations uh, over from early 2016 through the end of 2017. Uh, at the beginning of 2018, we deployed our intervention. We re redesigned the order form for short-acting opioids. And we see an abrupt and substantial jump in or congruence with these guidelines. Uh, we see that the, uh, before the change, there was, a, it was an average of about 12% what we're calling concordant prescriptions, concordant with the CDC guideline. And it jumped up immediately to 31% and held pretty steady over time. Uh, this was uh, analyzed in an interrupted time series analysis. Uh, so we can see that this made um, a uh, pretty substantial and helpful jump. By contrast, interestingly, when we did this at uh, Institute for Family Health, you can see that the e-prescribing intervention uh, did not have much of a change. There was about a six to seven percentage point increase, but this was not statistically significant. We think this is a ceiling effect. We think that the community health center, as you can see, was much more conservative in their prescribing. You can see a much larger proportion, about 50, almost 50% of their prescriptions were at this 12 or fewer pills. And I'll just go back for a second so that you can see uh, that at Wild Cornell, um, we were only at about 12% congruence at the same time that, well, that Institute for Family Health was at 44% congruence. Uh, so there was very little impact on prescribing choices at Institute for Family Health, largely because they were already doing better than we were. Um, however, there was another win, which was far fewer keystrokes were required. In the six months before the intervention, um, 3,500 keystrokes were needed to place those orders. In the six months after the intervention, 1,300 keystrokes were, were needed. So more than uh, about a 60% reduction in keystrokes. This is an enormous benefit. Um, there's very little that we do in health IT that ends up being less uh, work for the prescriber, fewer keystrokes. And, and this is one that we think is a, is a real benefit of our intervention. So uh, simply redesigning the e-prescribing order form by resetting the defaults had a pretty strong effect on prescribing choices. It did not interrupt workflow. There was a ceiling effect, it appears. Um, but even when there was a ceiling effect, the intervention reduced the number of clicks needed uh, from about 24 keystrokes before the intervention to nine keystrokes afterwards. Uh, so over the, over the um, universe of all sorts of work that the provider is doing, this is going to add up and make their lives just a little bit better. This is actually the second intervention that we tried um, to using this idea of the of the default. We previously had used something similar to try to encourage use of generic drugs. 
as I'm sure this audience knows, generic medications are, are equivalent to brand name drugs, but are far cheaper. And because of that lower cost, patients are more likely to take them, particularly patients who are on who are low income or on fixed income, such as uh, people on Medicare, um, because the co-pays are so much lower. Um, however, pharmaceutical companies market brand name drugs heavily, and there's nobody really doing that same kind of marketing for generics. Uh, so like many institutions, we tried to raise awareness of the benefits of generic prescribing, particularly for low income um, and uh, fixed income patients. And um, through these awareness raising efforts, we do see a, a tiny increase in the proportion of generics prescribed over over time, but it's it's a pretty minor increase. We then tried uh, something similar to what we did with the uh, opioid intervention. In the typical, in the old system, the doctor would type in a brand name. Uh, the brand name would appear in electronic order and that's what would get sent to the pharmacy and that's what the patient would receive. In the new system, um, as soon as the physician writes in the brand name, it is switched automatically to the generic name. And that is what would get sent to the pharmacy and what would be given to the patient unless the physician takes one additional click on the dispense as written button, that's the DAW. And in that case, um, the, the prescription would revert back to the brand name and that's what would go to the pharmacy. So rather than, uh, in this case, what we did was we reduced the friction, uh, we made it simpler to prescribe the generic and we added one keystroke if you wanted to prescribe uh, the brand name. That one keystroke made a huge difference. Uh, we more than doubled the rate uh, of that at which generics were prescribed, and it remained steady over time, as you can see after January 2010. So to wrap up these two uh, these two projects, I think we all recognize how much CDS systems can increase burden if they're not well designed. They can add keystrokes, they can add cognitive effort, um, they can interrupt workflow. And all of those are reasons for dissatisfaction with uh, CDS and with EHRs in general. Uh, in some cases, these friction reduction approaches can be more effective. And the, the, the thing that they have in common is that we are removing the barriers to choosing the desired option. Rather than making it more work to choose the de desired option, we are reducing the friction so that more people will choose the desired option and um, bonus, we will free up cognitive work, cognitive load, we'll free up keystrokes for use in other places where they need to be, um, where they need to be used. Uh, this has been a very collaborative set of projects um, done in collaboration with our information systems department at Weill Cornell and the information systems department at Institute for Family Health. And uh, the opioid project in particular was funded by the New York State Health Foundation. Thank you very much. Uh, I won't be there for the Q&A, um, but my contact information is here and I'd be very interested to hear from anybody afterwards. Thank you so much.